الثاني على حب الحسن والحسين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بفضل الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله أجمعين محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما يخشى الله من عباده العلماء صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى الله على محمد وآل محمد Fear is an emotion that many of us feel and it's something that is essential within the human being. However, when we talk about the concept of fear, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, surely the ones that fear Allah are the ulama, the scholars, the intellectuals, the academia of a people are the ones that have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is generally because they have an understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the greater the understanding, this fear increases. And this is what's called rational fear. That this degree of fear is something that we should have and it's rational. But before we speak about the rational fear, there's a fear that is called irrational fear. And irrational fear is something that's dangerous. It's something that's crippling. And people shouldn't have irrational fear. الشيطان يعدكم الفقر ويأمركم بالفحشاء that the shaytan he promises poverty or really in this context of this verse it means he threatens poverty and then he commands you to do licentious acts this all of it arises from fear generally an irrational fear so people create things that they're afraid of and they build up that fear within themselves and that fear is non-existent even if something is going to happen and you know something is going to befall you you're going to be bankrupted for example the bank is going to take away the house it's going to happen there's no reason to add, to add extra anxiety and pressure to what's going to happen anyway it's going to happen and so because it's going to happen why upset yourself? Just turn to the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already given you. The pleasures that you have in this dunya. Whatever you know is certain in this world and in the hereafter. And this is what you turn to. Most importantly, obviously it's reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One day there was a group of boys. And they were just hanging out and they were talking to each other. Who is the most courageous out of us? Because this fear breeds off al-qawwa al-ghadabi your faculty of anger or lack thereof and so they were sitting down who is more courageous who is braver and so they decided this story is set in an Arab land where the people wear dashdash so they wear thawb long clothing this is important to the story just pack that away and they sit together and they say alright who's the bravest of us someone says I am I am they said the bravest of us is the one who goes into the middle of the cemetery at night which one of you will do that? This cemetery that was speaking about, this story is set in Yemen. And the, in Yemen there's a, a cemetery known as Wadi Barahut. And according to the narrations, this is the place where all of the souls of the condemned go to. The souls of the Mu'mineen all go to Wadi Salam, which is next to Amir al-Mu'mineen, salamullahi alayhi. That no matter where they, they are buried, their souls gather there, and this is where they meet and see one another. In Wadi Salam, near the grave of a middle mu'minin, salawatullah alayhi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all this privilege. But the people who are not, they go to Wadi Barahut. And this place is where the souls of the condemned gather. So this was the cemetery that they had in mind. So they said, who will go there in the middle of the night? So some tough guy says, I'll do it. I'll be the guy that does it. They said, and how will you prove you got there? He says, I have a dagger. I will stick the dagger in the middle of the cemetery. And then 
The next day when you have a look, you'll come and you'll see my dagger is in the middle of the cemetery and it's proof that I've gone there. So he leaves to go in the middle of the night and they're not even going to watch him. They're too afraid. So they stay back where they are. And they wait. An hour passes, two hours pass. He doesn't come. The Fajr comes. He still doesn't come. So they said, let's go to the cemetery and see. So when they enter the cemetery, they walk around and eventually they find him laying on the floor, dead. And his dagger is stuck in his thob, in the dash dash. So he went into the middle of the cemetery. He stuck the dagger. When he went to run away, he felt something tugging on his dash dash. So out of fear, he dropped dead. He dropped dead. He thought one of the dead had probably come out and grabbed his leg or grabbed his clothes. And he dropped dead. This, my brothers and sisters, is irrational fear. That he had an irrational fear of something that obviously is an impossibility. Something that would never happen. But from that fear, it was so grave that he died. He died from how difficult and uh, uh, grave this fear was. Forgive the pun. How grave the fear was, he uh, dropped dead, he died. And so fear, irrational fear, is something that really, as a Muslim, you should be away from. Irrational fear of bankruptcy, irrational fear of losing the people that you love in this world. To have that fear is something that's irrational. Why? Everything within this world is fleeting. Everything is going to go. And a lot of the time, if you think about it, this is what upsets us most, for example, when somebody dies. It's not just that they died, but it's because I'm losing them. That you are more afraid about how you feel about the event, how you feel about what has happened, and how, would, how it will actually affect you. And so when you have an understanding, and you use your intellect to combat your imagination, this imagination that creates these false images of things that are not realistic, things that will not happen. And Iblis capitalizes on this. He capitalizes on it. There was a man, a story of a man, this was about 10 years ago. He got into a haram action and he got addicted to this haram action. This haram action was gambling. And gambling is one of the worst things. It's, it really is one of the worst sins that you can commit. It's from the Kaba'ir. In the Quran, Allah refers to it as Al-Maysar. And the reason it's called that, Maysar means the easy. The easy thing. Because the money comes easily and the money goes easily. This is why it's called Al-Maysar. For this man became an addict at gambling. And he started gambling so much. He was of Lebanese descent. This was in America. And he lost all of his money. So he said, all right, the way to bring back this money, I'll just go play double or nothing. But I need a good amount of money and I don't have any. So what he did, he used another thing. This is called makr. Makr is plotting. When you plot against people, in other words, you have something within your heart that's other than what you are showing. So you have a smile on your face, but really you're planning against this person. You want their downfall. You want to bring them down. And this is something that we need to be aware of that doesn't exist in Islam. It's, it, it's not meant to be. This is what I mean. It doesn't exist. It's not something that's allowable. Al-Makr fal-Nar, there's a narration that says, if you plot against people, you fall into the fire of hell. And many a person has done this throughout history. If you remember even at the point where Muslim Ibn Aqil, the cousin of Imam al Hussein. And the ambassador to the Kufa, he had the opportunity to kill Ibn Ziyad. And Ibn Ziyad was in charge of the Kufa at the time. He had taken uh, leadership there. He had kicked out the old governor, Nu'man ibn al-Bashir. He uh, exiled him from the governorship position, took the governorship position, and he was looking for Muslim to kill him. And so there was a plan that was devised by Hani ibn Urwa. He said that when he enters the house, we'll give you the signal, you come out from behind the door and you kill Ibn Ziyad and it's over. And so they keep trying to, they, they, they use, according to the narration, he recites a certain poem. And when he hears that poem, Muslim is meant to come out and kill Ibn Ziyad. But he doesn't. And then Ibn Ziyad leaves and they said, what's wrong with you? Why would you do this? You had a chance to kill him. And he says to, he, he says to them, the Muslim does not use trickery. 
the Holy Prophet said that the Muslim does not use trickery. And so I refuse to use this trickery to kill Ibn Ziyad in this manner. This is something that's truly unbelievable when you think about it. This is just one in the, the whole history of Islam. We have many of these. Many of these. But they tried to use this sort of trickery and this plot to go against the people. And so this man, he decides, the, our gambling buddy, he decides to go and see all the people that he knows that trust him and he says to them, I need money, lend me money. Or he promises them an investment. He says, if you give me the money, I'm going to invest it. You're going to get you know, a percentage back, whatever the profit is that I make. So they don't know what he's doing. They don't know he's gambling. So they all begin to lend him money. He ends up lending a couple of hundred thousand dollars of people. He borrows it of, of these people. And he goes straight to Vegas. Sin City. He goes to Las Vegas. This is a true story. He gets there. And you can guess what happened. He bit double or nothing, and he walked out with nothing. So on the flight back, the shaitan told him, what are you going to do now? You can't lend off anyone. So he started thinking in his head, I can't get any of that money back. I'm going to lose the house. My, he had uh, a wife and children. He said, my children are going to live on the street. My wife will have nowhere to go. And he kept playing over in his head, over in his head, over in his head. So when he got back, he killed his wife, and he killed his children. And then he killed himself. This was the end of it. All of this was from what? An irrational fear. Even if he chose to stop at that moment and seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he could have built everything back. It wouldn't be the same as it was. But still, he would be alive, they would be alive, he would still have hope for something else for the future. But instead, he just erased all of this. He erased all of those ideas and he let Iblis, the accursed one, play on his irrational fear. We have a narration that says if somebody fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah will make everything afraid of him. And if somebody doesn't fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he'll be afraid of everything. And you see, the people who don't fear Allah, they fear everything else. And the fear of everything else is what throws them into the worst positions that they get into. They fear everything. They fear their wife. They fear their boss. They fear the government. They fear, they fear everything. Everything. They fear every creature. And how do they escape this fear? Bad habits. Look at the kuffar. How do they live? Monday to Friday, they come to work on time. They leave on time. Friday at beer o'clock, they go and get drunk. Saturday, they go and party. And then the hangover afterwards. And the hangover isn't just something that's physical. But the hangover is something that's spiritual and mental. That they feel terrible for the whole rest of the day. Because it hasn't taken away the fears and the anxieties that they have had stored up in there. And so this, my brothers and sisters, is the irrational fear. This is the incorrect fear. And it leads people to do all sorts of things. How do we combat this irrational fear? How do we combat it? Have you heard of the concept of power by numbers? Power by numbers means people are strong when they're in a group. So the bigger the group, the stronger you feel. If you were, let's say, in a group of people, say everyone in the world was with you, and you were going to fight an enemy, a single guy, and you've got 8 billion people supporting you, would you be afraid of this guy? Absolutely not. You'd have no fear. You walk up and you've got everyone, you're rolling in numbers, you've got all your cousins with you, so this guy has no chance, and you have absolutely no fear because you feel like you can destroy him. With us as Muslims, we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with us. Hasbi Allah wa na'mal wakil. Alladheena qalu hasbun Allah wa na'mal wakil fanqalabu bi na'matin min Allah wa fadl wa lam yamsasum su'a. That we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with us. Allah is sufficient as a guardian. That if the whole world was to come against me, but I have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then I have no fear. Because even if they all wanted to hurt me and do something bad to me, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refuses this, then I have no issues. And this is what the believer has. The believer has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why the believer doesn't, the irrational fears don't concern him. 
Because he has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with him. And, and ultimately, this world is fleeting. So some of these things that we fear, for example, I say to myself, I fear losing my child. What if my child runs on the road and gets hit by a car? Oh my God, I'm going to lock him up. I have to put him on a leash when I walk with him. You know, so he doesn't. Now don't get me wrong, some of these things are rational safety measures. Like putting a belt on a child when he's in a car. This is rational. Driving uh, at the speed limit, it's rational. These things are important. But there's no need to get to the level of hysterics in terms of your anxiety away from this thing. But what we need to understand is that although I have love of my family, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if I lose this family, Allah will give me a better family. And the only reason I have this deep love for my family, some of it is selfish, but the majority of it is what we spoke about, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's placed in my heart for these particular people that are of my creed and that are of me. Isn't that the case? And so ultimately, losing them, if I have Allah, it doesn't matter. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's the one. And if you think about it, if Allah takes that mercy out of my heart, then they'll be like normal person, any normal person that's around me, any stranger that I deal with. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he reveals to the Holy Prophet, ala dhikri sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He reveals to the Holy Prophet, he tells him, Ahbib man shit, fa'innaka mufariqah. He says, Love whom you please, or who you please, or whatever it is that you want, for surely you will have to leave them. This is important. Whoever you love, or whatever you love, you love your house, you have to leave it one day. You love your car, you have to leave it one day. You love this shirt that you're wearing, you have to leave it one day. You love those heels, you have to leave them one day. You love your husband, your wife, your parents, your children. One day, you have to part with them. There's going to be a moment, a time, when you part with these people. This is important. When I understand this, how can I continue to be happy if this is the case? Because I have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the one that gave them to me, when I didn't deserve them, or it wasn't worthy of me to have them, is the one that will give me better than them. The one that will make me pleased with whatever it is that he gives me. When you look at the imams and the lives of the imams and the lives of the prophets, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon them all, we see that throughout their lives, these things didn't concern them because ultimately they knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give them something better than this. They knew that if it was for Allah, this is the most important thing. Why? Because they had fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because when you have fear of Allah this is when you understand Allah sometimes we refer to taqwa as God consciousness and God weariness that you're aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but taqwa in essence is about fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having that fear and when you understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you have some comprehension of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his ability through looking at his creation, you then have that taqwa and you have that fear of Allah and that is that proper fear. That proper fear and that fear that it's in its correct and right place, through that, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you through that the ability to have a happy life. We hear in the traditions that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, that the harsher it got and the more of his family members that he lost on the day of Ashura, it says, that the face of Abu Abdullah was brighter and brighter. The harder the things happened. The worse the things happened. The more of his family that was killed. Why? Because his connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what they were going upon was, was truth. And then Allah reveals to the Prophet, He says, Live how you please to live. For surely, you're going to die. These are sobering words. But it brings you to the reality that this world is transient. And however it is that you're going to live, ultimately you're going to have to leave this world. This really gives you an idea of how one should live. Of how one should 
have their relations with this world, of how one, sh one should have relations with this dunya. That ultimately, when you think like this, you'll be a better person for it. People think, oh, if I think like this, oh, this is, these are dark thoughts. No, they're not dark thoughts. This allows you to act in a realistic and responsible way. For how many a time have we heard of someone passing away or someone dying and they were having a fight with someone and they never made up and that person dies? And then what happens is, oh, I wish if I knew he was going to die, I would have done that. Or somebody treats someone harshly and then they die and they don't get to make up. They don't get to come back and see eye to eye. That's the truth, truth of this world. This is how it happens. It happens sometimes, uh, I think Amir al muminin refers to it, that, that you, you might be laughing in the day and crying in the night. Or you might be laughing in the night and you're crying in the day. From something like this happening. Now these are rational fears. But they're only rational fears if you don't have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then all of this is covered. Why? Because you begin to understand what this world about what this world is about and what the hereafter is about. And do whatever you please, surely it's coming back to you. Whatever it is you do in this world, it's going to come back to you. Whatever action you do, it's coming back to you. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the paradigm of this world. If you're good to your parents, your parents are going to be good to you. If you're good to your uh, spouse, for example, then Allah will send you someone who will be good to your spouse and to your, to your um, daughters, inshallah. And vice versa. Vice versa. It all comes back. It all comes back. How many a time do we see, for example, birru aba'akum? Be good to your fathers, your parents, your children will be good to you. How many a time do you see, مثلاً, a parent, an old man or an old woman, and they say, oh, my children are the worst. They, my children do this, my children do that. And then if you rewind the time machine, you will see that this guy was a demon to his parents. An absolute demon. Not all the time. Not all the time. But a vast majority of the time, this is what you will find. Vast majority of the time, that's what you'll find. Whatever action you do, that action or that thing is going to come back straight to you. That action that, that, action that you have done is coming straight back to you. In, the, in, in Allah, Sari'u al-Hisab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is quick to reckoning. In this world and in the, in the hereafter. And so what does fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring about for us? Having that fear of Allah, what does it bring about? When you have that fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you understand the power and the might of Allah, there's a beautiful hadith on Imam al Baqir alayhi salam. Afwan, on Amir al Mu'mineen, sallallahu alayhi Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. On Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ali. Allahum sallallahu alayhi wa ali. He says that if the believer knew about the punishment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set aside for the sinful, the believer knew what the punishment that was set aside, then he would even have no greed for paradise. If the believer knew the punishment that Allah has set aside, he would say, oh, I don't want no paradise, I don't want anything. Just this punishment, keep me away from it. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one that created you, that knew, knows exactly what you are. And then he says, and if the kafir, the non-believer, if the kafir knew the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you would see that not anyone would lose hope of attaining paradise. That even the kafir would have hope that he might attain paradise. If he knew the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This goes back to our discussion on hope and fear. Being in between hope and fear. Al-Khawf wa raja and so if a believer knew this, then he would have no greed for paradise. Even. This is how much he would be turned off existence. And if the non-believer knew the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then none would ever despair from paradise. They, they would think that they can attain paradise. Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi he says, 
لو كشف لي الغطاء ما ازددت يقينا that even if the veil was uncovered to me I would not be increased in certainty and certitude but this same imam says that if on the day of judgment only one person was going to enter the fire of hell I would fear it would be me and if only one person was going to enter paradise I would have enough hope that it would be me that he gives you an idea of exactly where it stands and so when we look at this concept of fear the stages of what that fear is meant to bring within you because you need to think about the power and the might of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know I mean sometimes when we hear about the fire of hell it seems abstract that it's hard for us to comprehend what does this mean that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that uh, the sharab is min hamim that, they, that what, the, what they drink is this boiling hot water and the ghaslin ghaslin they say it's the pus that comes out of the wounds from them being damaged in hell this is what they drink and this is what they eat scalding hot water whatever that is and whatever that purulence is this pus and muck that comes out of their wounds this is what, they, what they'll have nastajiru billah this is just and it gives you an idea although we don't really even know what the extent of this is Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi he gives a, 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 an image of it that's, that's close, uh, closer for us to understand to comprehend he says that imagine the bala and the trials in this world but above you is a layer of hellfire and below you is a layer of hellfire so imagine going through the same difficulties you go in this world but you're, you're enclosed in a layer of hellfire <coughs> and beneath you is a layer of hellfire and stajiru billah when someone begins to think about this all of a sudden sin doesn't become fun anymore that if you remember where, where does that lead to no matter what the shaitan says not interested like if I got you the best food that you can think of and of the best foods in the world although we live in a time just to show you how, how much from our fears they have brainwashed us corporations, the authorities, the, the soldiers of Iblis, the soldiers of Iblis in, in general have brainwashed us. That some foods, they, you know, they give them the five star ratings, the star ratings for how healthy they are, right? So, so some foods have a one star rating and some foods have a five star rating if it's very healthy. And honey, which is pure, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he revealed to the bees what to do to make this honey. And notice a bee, subhanAllah, doesn't go to anything disgusting. It goes to flowers, it goes to the pollen, but it doesn't go near anything that smells bad or looks bad. And from that they make this pure honey. And honey has a one-star rating. This is how backwards the whole thing is. You know? Water, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, this water which is one of the, the most alien and strangest liquids on this earth it truly is a very strange liquid if you look at the, the the deeper you look at the properties of water the more strange that you will find that it is for example it's the only liquid or if something's made up a lot of water that when it's frozen it will float on the surface of the liquid but anything else that you freeze will sit at the bottom but of the other things within this water Within this water that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created, He created it to purify us. Tahoor. This is something to purify, to wash your face with. But instead, what do we do? We don't wash our face with it. We're upset about wudu. I remember one of my relatives that they used to like to make fun of religious stuff. He goes, uh, You know, when are they going to make up a, a pill for wudu? I'm sick of doing this. You know, you're going, well, just give me a pill or pop it and that's it and I'll be on wudu. This guy's thinking he's progressive. That when, when are they going to create something so I don't have to put water on myself? Well, alhamdulillah, they listened to him. They must have heard him. Alexa must have heard him and they've, they created the hand sanitizer. Trash. Absolute trash. It's rubbish. So they created a hand sanitizer. Everyone's with this alcohol gel. I don't even know what it's made of. Okay. To, and they say, oh, yeah, this purifies your hand and this purifies what? Nothing matches what water is, but just to show you how 
uh, brainwashed we've become based on irrational fears. We spoke about germ theory in the 1800s and then afterwards, that's it. They just ran with this germ th theory in the 1900s. So the 1800s, they had the idea that there's these small living things. Remember a few nights ago we spoke about, about seven nights ago we spoke about germ theory. And then in the 1900s, <coughs> the corporations figured that, you know what, we can capitalise on this. Water's not good enough. Instead of water, we're going to create all these detergents for you. So instead of our women washing their face with water face masks and creams and I don't know what, you know, things, all of these things. We're in, in our ahadith, we have things that say that if you do wudu, you're, it'll brighten your face. For the ones, this is for the brothers and the sisters that pray salah to layl, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will brighten their face. Their face will look cleaner and clearer. I mean, I'm sure you've noticed even from fasting, many of you, your skin would have cleared up. Not just from fasting, but from, the, inshallah, the, the spirituality that we are gaining. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So all of that was just to tell you that honey is good. <laughs> if someone was to offer you honey that was laced with cyanide, poisoned honey, you wouldn't go near it. No matter how beautiful that honey looked, you wouldn't go near it. You would absolutely avoid it. Because you know that if you take it, you're going to get killed. This is called wara. Wara is when you, are, you abstain from what's sinful and what temptations there is. Taqwa is a stage above wara when you begin to go away from what is dubious. That this doesn't sound right. You know? I'm not sure that this is, you, know, you, you feel like I think I'm being catfished. I'm not that handsome. You know? So when you feel that, this, this is taqwa. You go up a level. With this wara, with this taqwa, and this is all fueled by the fear of Allah. I'll tell you one story before we finish, inshallah. This fueled together, it gives you that ability. And then eventually, the stage above this, when you go through, past wara, you pass taqwa, it reaches the level of affa. And affa is basically a level where uh, it's loosely described as modesty, that you shy away from anything that brings you against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is abstinence? Taqwa is keeping away from the dubious, that this is, I'm not sure about this. So what is, something's haram, I'm going to keep away from it. The other one is, I'm not sure, I'm going to go to what I'm sure with. And then Affa is another level. That needs a whole discussion on, on, uh, on, its, uh, on its own. Amir al-Mu'mineen, sallallahu wa sallam he says, وَلَعَلَّ الْعَفِيفِ يَكَادُ أو يَكَادُ الْعَفِيفِ أَنْ يَكُونَ مَلَكًا مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ That it's as if the Afif, the one who is modest, it's almost as if he's vying to be or is one of the angels, that this is how the level he is. And so, inshallah, I will leave you with this short story because I've gone over time. And this is something for the brothers to consider. And again, when I say these stories, there's a lesson involved. But really, I'm in the hope when I speak to the brothers that are here, I'm confident that you people are concerned and serious about your religion. But the aim is not just for myself to learn and for you to learn, but for you to pass this on to the ones who don't come. For you to talk with the ones that are around you, the, the, the ones that are near to you, to set that example. Because I, I, I'm sure you are all now... Exemplars in this sense, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen you to be exemplars in, in this sense. This is a, a story that I've heard of, of one of the, the khutaba, Allah ahfadu. And he said basically that one day there was a group of guys, again, because <coughs> girls shouldn't be going out at all. <laughs> joke, joke. <laughs> I'm going to get shot for this one. <coughs> No, it, it's a mixed gathering, so that's what I meant. The clause is to mixed gathering. But a group of these boys, they got together and they said, you know, we want to go on, on an outing. So they decided to go somewhere. And one of the guys that was with them, he was very pious. He said, look, I don't really want to go with you guys because I'm not sure. What are we going to do? They said, no, come, come. You know, no, you know we're going to have fun. We're going to do this. Said, All right, fun. We're going to do this. So they went and they had their fun. And then when they get to their destination... 
They got like a hotel room or an Airbnb or something like that. And one of the guys who's got good connect with the shaitan, like one of those guys that won't throw the seven rocks in Hajj, he only throws six. He goes, I'll leave the last one so we can keep good relations just in case you don't know when I, when I might need this guy. <coughs> he goes and he organises uh, for, a, for a group of females to come. And these females are the females of the night kind. And so these females come and everyone says, yeah, oh, I'll take this girl, I'll take that girl. Each one takes a girl. And the pious guy goes, me, leave me out of this. The girl came up to him, she took him into the room. He said, please, don't even come near me. She said, why? <coughs> it's normal, blah, blah, blah. What, what, you're living in the Middle Ages, you're living in the Stone Age. He kept thinking, what should I say to get her away from me? What's the only thing I can say? He goes, well, I've got AIDS. So she said to him, that's okay, I also have AIDS. <laughs> the point is, he got away with it. Now, he made this white lie to get away, but the point is, him seeing this poisoned fruit and understanding that it's a poisoned fruit, this is the way that we should look at sin. That although the sin hasn't presented what it is, and we should have that fear. وَلَا يَخَافَنَّ أَحَدَكُمْ إِلَّا ذَنْبَ Amir al muminin says, don't fear anything except for the sins that you commit. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance of our holy Imam, Ajallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif. We ask Allah to have mercy on our dead, to cure our sick. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to clothe the people who have asked us for dua, inshallah, and the clothing of health and well-being and remove every illness from them. Uh, and uh, we specify, inshallah, al-hajj Abu Ammar, Allah yahfadhu and his daughter and his granddaughter and al Hajj Hassan Talib and Hajj Hakimi and everyone else uh, and uh, al Hajj Imam Muhammad. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clothe them in the clothing of well-being by the blessing of this holy month, insha'Allah, and clothe you all in the clothing of health and well-being and piety and taqwa and increase the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within your hearts. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma kun li waliyika al-salawatuka alayhi wa ala abai fi hadhihi al-sa'a kulli sa'a waliyan wa hafidha وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا تسكنه أرضك وتمتعه في أرضك يا أرحم الراحمين أعوذ بجلال وجهك الكريم رضي عني شهر رمضان يطلع الفجر من ليلة هذه كقبلي تبعة أو ذنب تعذبني عليه السلام وعلى أصحاب الحسين ورحمة الله وبركاته والأرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات